All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is the second part of uh, Chapter 4 Online Lectures on Machine Learning. So, last time, uh, we gave an introduction and talked about linear regression as the first subtopic of machine learning. We're going to pick up uh, from, from our last lecture and uh, move on to maximum likelihood estimation. So let's venture forward to maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, so here's the problem setting for maximum likelihood estimation. The setting is you are provided with m data points that represent some random variable y. Your goal, quite simply, is to fit a probability distribution to this data. So that distribution could be Gaussian, it could be a uniform distribution, it could be a Laplacian distribution, Poisson, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We won't emphasize too much on the different flavors of distributions. Uh, let's just keep it general and imagine that we wish to fit some probability distribution to this data. So to assist us, uh, let's define some notation. First, we're going to denote, let me make this full screen, First, we're going to denote um, p of y semicolon theta to be the probability density function, PDF, uh, for random variable y. Now, um, p is a probability density function for random variable y, and theta are going to be free parameters. So this is an n by 1 vector, and these free parameters are parameters that we would like to identify or fit to our data. So this is another type of regression problem ultimately and, and that's what you're going to see. In this case our model is a probability distribution as opposed to a linear function or a polynomial function. Um, our, our, our model is actually going to be a probability density function and the free parameters are given uh, by theta. Now next let's define this notion of a likelihood function. A likelihood function is when we consider p of y semicolon theta as a function of theta for fixed value y. In other words, um, the the likely or the log likelihood function is going to be the, the the log of the PDF as a function of theta uh, for a given value of y. So one way to say this using different English would be how likely is this parameter vector value theta given this data y. So we call it uh, the, the likelihood function. Now because the probabilities can be uh, quite small um, and can vary by orders of magnitude, it's useful to take the log of this. That is one way to think about it. There's actually a bunch of other uh, technical reasons why talking about the log likelihood is, is more efficient and easier than talking about the likelihood itself. Okay, so now we have this notion of a likelihood function. We define the log likelihood function, L of theta. And with this, our optimization problem is going to look as follows. We seek to uh, optimize uh, the free parameters theta such that we maximize the log likelihood function. That is, we would like that, um, what we wish is to find a theta star which maximizes how uh, well this probability distribution explains our data y. Okay, so that's our optimization function. We want to maximize the log likelihood uh, function. Now, interestingly, the whole punchline of what I'm going to show in, in the next several slides is that this maximum likelihood estimation problem, which is uh, an optimization problem here, it turns out that, remarkably, it's a convex optimization problem for many, many common scenarios. So this is quite, quite cool. And, and uh, you'll see we'll actually get some least squares um, interpretations, which will give sort of a whole different statistics view on the linear regression that we've talked about in, in the previous uh, video. All right, so let's move forward. And let's look at a, at a concrete example here. So here we'd like to do maximum likelihood estimation for a linear model. And let me consider a linear measurement model, meaning 
uh, what I can measure is is y. These are measured uh, data points, and then um, it's it's linear because uh, y is going to be given by this linear function theta transpose phi, where phi are regressors, and and generally speaking, we we know the values of these regressors phi sub i. So relative to chapter one, you might recognize this as the output equation in a dynamical system. You can think of uh, theta transpose as playing the role of the C matrix, which is our output matrix, and phi could be uh, states that, that we can measure. VI, this uh, models some sort of measurement errors or noise. Okay, these are measurement errors or noise. So, so these are just... Uh, uh, v, what we're trying to do is capture the idea that um, even if we know the parameters perfectly, there could be some error between our linear measurement model and what our true measured output is as a result of some modeling error, perhaps some, some measurement noise here. Okay, now one important assumption as we move forward is that we're going to assume that uh, the noise here, these, these VIs, are independent and identically distributed with a probability density uh, P. Okay, so IID is an acronym. It stands for Independent and Identically D Distributed Random Variables. Um, so let's break that down. Independent means uh, the probability of V1 does not depend on the value of V2. So each instance of V for, for all the I's, for, for all the data we have, is generated by its own independent distribution. There's no uh, cross-correlation between the different VIs. That's what the independent part means. Identically distributed means this probability density function uh, is true for all the VIs, for all I's uh, here. Okay, so it has identical distributions, but all the VIs are independent from one another. All right. So now, uh, we would like to form the likelihood function given all the measurement points yi and all the regress regressors vi. So, so this is our data. Our data is yi and phi. And the likelihood function is going to be given by the products of the likelihood for each data point yi and phi. So here we have the symbol, which means take, take the uh, product of all the elements across i. And um, here what we've done is we plugged in all the individual values of VI here. So, so let me slow down just a moment um, in case it's going a, a tad fast here in terms of uh, independent random variables and, and this log likelihood and the product. So let me, let me jump on over to, to Photoshop here. Okay, so, so first, uh, I should probably break down Whoops, sorry, just getting the hang of using this pen. Independent independent random variables. So, so for example, if I am looking at the probability of two random variables, say x and y, this represents two random events. If they're independent, then what this means is the probability of x occurring and the probability of y occurring is given by the product of these two events occurring. Okay, so for example, random variable x could be the probability that I have a burrito for lunch. Y could be a random variable representing the probability that it rains. Now, it raining and me eating a burrito for lunch are probably independent of each other. I think they have nothing to do with each other. Uh, so because they're independent random variables, if I want to calculate the probability that I had a burrito and it's raining then this would be given by the probability that I have a burrito times the probability that it's raining. OK, 
Okay, so that's an example of what independent random variables mean. So um, back in the slide deck, we looked at the probability of all the v's. Okay, so this is the probability density function of of all the of of the vector of these vi's. So we have vi one to vi m. It looks like. Okay, so I can rewrite this as the probability of VI1, VI2, VIM. All right, now we've, we've assumed that uh, the VIs are independent and identically distributed. All right, so then the probability of all these these VIs, because they're independent, is going to be the product of the individual probabilities. Okay, and we can use this using the, the product notation. This kind of big capital pi, where I goes from 1 to M of P. VI. Okay. Now that's all that's on this uh, slide here. So I have the product of all the VIs. Now VI is just YI minus theta transpose phi I. So we've just substituted uh, that in there. That's all that happened. Okay. So the log likelihood function is given by this formula as defined on the previous slide. L of theta is log of the uh, PDF of V parameterized by free parameters theta. So now what I'm going to do is take uh, the log of what's in equation 16 here. Now what's pretty cool about the log is we can recall the following property of logarithms is the log of a product is equal to the sum of each uh, of the log of each element here. Okay, this is a property of, uh, of, of the log function here. So once I take the log of everything on the right-hand side of 16, then this product actually becomes a sum. In other words, I, can, uh, uh, I have log product, and that, with this logarithm product, becomes summation log. Okay, so, so not, uh, we're not commuting these operators. Um, we're, we're using this logarithm property in this product then um, gets pulled out and becomes a summation here. Okay, so now we have this formula, which is our log likelihood function um, for our linear measurement model. And this is ultimately going to be uh, the, the object, the mathematical object that we wish to maximize. So let's now look at that. The maximum likelihood estimation problem is to maximize, with respect to theta, this log likelihood function which is going to be the summation of the log of all the probabilities across i for all my, my data training examples. Now, amazingly, this log likelihood function is concave for several common distributions, or you can say the likelihood function is log concave whoops, for several common uh, distributions. So what we're going to do next now is hypothesize um, that VI follows a one example distribution and here's the punchline. I'm going to show you that this becomes a quadratic program. In fact, it's a least squares problem um, which looks just like the least squares from linear regression and uh, and this kind of falls out beautifully. So it gives a statistics interpretation to least to, to linear regression with least squares but instead of viewing it in a deterministic setting, now we're giving a statistical interpretation in terms of maximum likelihood. Okay, so that's the punchline. Let's now follow this through. So, so let's imagine that these VIs are, um, so they're independent and identically distributed, and the distribution for each of the VIs is given by this normal distribution that is zero mean and has a variance of sigma squared. Okay, now 
Because it's normally distributed, uh, we can then use the formula for the uh, probability density function for a normally distributed random variable. And that's all that this says. P of V is given by this formula uh, for, for a normally distributed random variable, V. Okay, then now what we can do is substitute in this formula for the probability density function um, that is Gaussian in this case. Okay, so now all I'm going to do is substitute in uh, this, th this formula. And once I do that, I can then use uh, the, the properties of the logarithm to decompose this. So let's actually uh, break this down again if it's, if it's going a, a tad fast. So I have, uh, let's make a new page. Okay, so I have a uh, log of pi which is going to be log of, uh, whoops, this is p, p of vi Okay, and, the, and now we're just going to substitute, substitute in the formula for the distribution function um, for a Gaussian here. So we'll look back, and uh, the first part is 2 pi sigma squared to the minus 1 half. Okay. All this to the minus 1 half. And then we have e to the minus v squared over 2 sigma squared. Okay, so now we can simplify this. You'll note that we have log times a uh, log of a product of two uh, two parts. Let's call this first part A, and let's call this first part B. So then we can use that property that we exploited before. Log of A times B is log of A. plus log of b. So let me just apply that formula. All right, so now I've applied this formula here, and there's a few other properties of the logarithm um, that, that I'm going to use. So let's look at this first term. We have log of the quantity 2 pi sigma squared to the power minus 1 half. Uh, you may also recall the following property, which is uh, can be proven with the property above. But if I have log of x to the a, then that is equivalent to a times log x. For example, suppose that b equals a, you can basically prove this, uh, this, this formula here. So now I can exploit this property to rewrite the first term as follows. Basically, I bring this minus one half out in front. Okay, that's quite cool. Now I have log of an exponential. By the way, let me let me mention when I say log here, this is the I actually mean the the natural log. So excuse this uh, abusive notation here. So natural log and exponential are inverse functions of each other. So when I take the natural log of the exponential, I just get the argument. So this spits right back out uh, minus. 1 over 2 sigma squared times v squared. Okay, so now I'm going to flip back to the slides, and you can see that's exactly uh, what we have here. Okay, 
And then we plug that into the argument of the summation, and that's how we get equation 19. Now, uh, we're, we're going to take a few more steps that are uh, not too hard to follow. So they, they go as follows. We're going to do the summation over i. Focus on this first term here. This first term does not depend on i at all, right? So we're just going to sum this term, this constant, from the perspective of the summation m times. So that's why I get this factor of m. Okay, so this is just summing this constant term m times, so I just multiply this term by m. Okay, uh, this coefficient here does not depend on m, so we factor it out of the summation, and the summation uh, only gets applied to vi squared, right? All right, so now we've arrived at equation 20. Let's remind ourselves that vi is given by yi minus theta transpose phi. This is important because now we expose the dependence on, on theta, which is our optimization variable. Okay, so now I'm going to take this equation, just substitute where it says vi, I'm going to write yi minus theta transpose phi i, and I get this equation. Then we'll recognize that the sum of squares is just the two norm squared, provided that I write the individual elements here in a matrix vector format. So this looks just like the linear regression exercise that we saw uh, in the previous lecture. We're going to stack... Um, uh, the the elements of y into a column vector shown here. We're going to stack uh, the phi's into a matrix shown here, given by matrix capital phi, and then we can write it write uh, the summation of squares as this two norm squared. Okay, so equation twenty two is what we want to optimize, and we want to optimize this with respect to theta. Now. Uh, what you should recognize right now is basically what we have is something that looks like um, a least squares optimal fitting, which is this term here, times some coefficient, which doesn't affect our minimizer, plus some constant term, which doesn't affect our minimizer either. Okay? So all of this stuff in, uh, that is not the two norm, we can view as a distraction in terms of um, minimizing. Uh, with respect to theta, and we get something that's that's a two norm squared of this uh, linear uh, matrix vector expression of theta. So this turns out to be a a least squares problem. So then the maximum likelihood problem with Gaussian noise is a least squares problem. I can just rewrite this as um, minimizing this two norm squared. Now let me back up for a second. Remember we we. Uh, we are trying to maximize the log likelihood. Here we finally got to 22. Um, and uh, because we have a minus sign here, I can maximize uh, the, the, the negative of this two norm squared by taking away that ne negative and then minimizing this two norm squared. Okay? So amazingly, the maximum likelihood um, estimation solution for linear measurement model with Gaussian noise is a least squares problem. Okay, so least squares comes back again. Now, as an exercise, uh, we can also derive the uh, maximum likelihood estimation uh, optimization formulation um, for our linear measurement model for the following distributions for VI. So before, we, we hypothesized that these errors were zero mean and normally distributed. We could also imagine that has a different distribution, say Laplacian noise or uniform noise. Amazingly, uh, you will see that these turn out to um, give us uh, least squares solutions with different types of norms. So let's actually work through number one here as an exercise together. Let's hypothesize that the noise is given by this Laplacian distribution. So first let's review what is a Laplacian distribution, so this is easy to, to look up. Um, the picture is on the right. Uh, it's parameterized uh, by, its, by its mean first of all, which is given by mu, excuse the different notation, but mu equals zero is the mean. Here we assume a zero mean. And then you've got some parameter which has something to do with the spread, if you will, or, or the variance. In the picture here they call it b. We're actually using the parameter a um, on, on the left-hand side here, excuse, excuse me for using slightly different notation. So the, the Laplacian distribution 
is something that's symmetric um, around zero. It's it's maximum at zero, meaning the most likely noise is zero. And then as the, the noise increases in magnitude, be it positive or negative, the probability of getting the higher magnitude noise um, drops off in an exponential fashion here. Okay. All right, so this is now our hypothesized distribution for the noise. And the punchline is you're going to see that the, the MLE optimization formulation is actually going to be minimizing the one norm for this distribution. So this mapping of probability distributions to norms for, for optimization is, is super cool. It's uh, quite, quite interesting to see how these uh, come together. So let's actually derive 24. Let's, let's briefly walk through these steps. So ultimately, uh, we're, we're going to be concerned with maximizing the log likelihood function, which can be rewritten as the sum of the logs for, for each of the uh, probabilities on VI. So here, I'm just going to plug in the formula for P of VI, which is given up top. So here, the log of, um, of this formula for the PDF for the Laplace distribution is given here. Now, we're going to take the log of this distribution up here. The first term, we see it's a log of products, where the first term 1 over 2a is the first of the two products, and then the exponential is the second of the two products. So then we could just sum those um, together, and that's why we get two terms here. And, um, and uh, here, because we're taking the log of an exponential, those are inverse functions of one another, so then we just get the argument spit back out. Okay, so this is basically the same steps as what we saw in the previous example with the Gaussian distribution here. Right? Now, I want to apply this summation. The first term has nothing to do with i, so we just sum that m times, so I have a multiplicative factor of m. Um, then the summation only applies to the absolute value of vi. We can factor out minus 1 over a shown here. Right? Now, just like before, I'll substitute in for vi yi minus theta transpose phi i. And so now I'm just rewriting the right-hand side of 25 to get the right-hand side of 26, where I've substituted in vi. And the sum of these absolute values can be written as a one norm using the same definitions for capital Y and capital Phi, which just aggregate the YI and Phi I data points here. And maximizing this objective function is the same as minimizing this one norm, right? Because we have an affine uh, function of our, of our norm, which is not... Um, uh, the, the minimizer of this is the same as the minimizer of this one norm here or the optimizer. Okay, so now we've, uh, we've, we've proven here that for exercise 1, the MLE optimization formulation for 15, where we have a Laplacian noise distribution, is given by this convex optimization problem. Namely, we're just going to minimize this, uh, the one norm of the vector of residuals. So that's, that's pretty cool. We, we can actually use CVX to uh, solve this problem. Okay, so now I'd like to go to something uh, a bit different. So now we're going to talk about a different type of regression known as logistic uh, regression. And I would like to uh, lecture on this example because uh, many of you are taking a companion class to my own called uh, Behavioral Modeling which talks about discrete choice models. So what I'm going to show you here is in these discrete choice models, which you um, might use to model how humans make choices, uh, there are parameters in that data-driven model. And what I'm going to show you is optimizing or fitting those parameters is a convex optimization problem that, that you can solve with some convex uh, optimization solver package like CVX or CVXPy, for example. So... Let's start out like this. Um, e even if you're not taking that course on behavior modeling or just watching this video and you're not in the class, uh, we can understand logistic regression as doing regression on a model that's trying to predict two outcomes, one or zero, like positive response or negative response if you want. So here, 
Um, the random variable, that is the thing that we are trying to predict, is going to be given by y, but y can only be 0 or 1. Now, we hypothesize that the probability of y is given by this, uh, uh, it's actually a Bernoulli distribution, but the probability that y equals 1 is given by little p, which is just a number, and the probability that y equals 0 is given by 1 minus p. So for example, you can imagine that y equals 1 corresponds to responding positively to a demand response request, and y equals 0 corresponds to ignoring that demand response request. So for example, I am an industrial electricity consumer, and I've signed up with my utility to be part of a demand response service. And when the utility or the system operator sends me a signal, uh, I have the option to reduce my electricity consumption in my industrial facility, and the electric utility will renumerate me. They will pay me to do so. Now, when they send me a signal um, that requests me to reduce my electricity consumption, I may respond to it positively, or I may completely ignore it, right? And uh, the probability in which I respond positively or negatively could depend on a variety of factors. So let's now break this down. We hypothesize here that the probability p is a function of someone's utility function. So as an industrial consumer who is part of this DR program, I uh, subconsciously perhaps have some sort of utility function. So here we're going to use uh, notions from utility theory, meaning that um, the the probability that I respond, so, so p this parameter P depends on this utility. And the idea here is that as the utility goes up, it may be more likely that I respond positively. So that's, that's the basic idea. Okay. So we imagine the utility function is given by this affine function. So, so this is uh, how much value I have to gain by, by this situation. And we model this uh, with this affine type of model, where we have free parameters beta i and beta 0, which is a constant offset. And then we have xi, which in the parlance or jargon of uh, discrete choice modeling, they call explanatory variables. You could also call this regressors. Um, it's, it's, it's really uh, independent uh, data, where the dependent data is, is y, ultimately. Okay, so the idea here is that we hypothesize that people have this internal utility function, um, and xi, these explanatory variables, which might impact my utility, could be a variety of factors, things that we could control or things that we don't control. So for example, um, the, the utility, the, the utility that I have or the value that I gain from uh, decreasing my electricity consumption in my factory, in my industrial facility, could depend on the day of the week. Okay, so it might make a difference if it's Saturday or, or Friday. It could depend on the time of day. It could make a difference if it's 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. It could depend on the renew, renumeration price, meaning how much will the utility give back to me in hard, cold cash uh, if I respond positively to this event. It could depend on the outside temperature. Maybe part of my electricity consumption has to do with just uh, heating or cooling my, my facility, which uh, uh, the power associated with that has to do with the outside temperature. Okay, so here what I'm going to do is take a weighted sum of all these explanatory variables with some coefficients uh, beta. Okay, these beta i's are the coefficients. Now, don't worry too much about the units of this. Indeed, we're taking some linear combination of apples and oranges. These are all different things. This is really just a conceptual idea that we somehow uh, weight these different factors and come up with some sort of, uh, uh, if you want, dimensionless uh, or, or dimension undefined utility function. Okay, so now we relate the probability p to the utility big U using this logistic formula or the logistic model which is given mathematically as follows little p of u is going to be given by e to the u all over 1 plus e to the u okay 
And all I've done here is substituted in what my definition is for you, so this isn't uh, too, too important. And now on the next slide, I want to draw you a picture of the shape of this function so we can visualize what it looks like. Okay, so here's the logistic model. P of u is e to the u all over 1 plus e to the u. And here's what that shape looks like. It's actually also known as a sigmoid function, uh, particularly in, uh, in the intellectual world of people working with neural networks. So it, it, it looks something as, as follows. It, it basically saturates to uh, 0 as the argument goes to minus infinity, and then it saturates to 1 as the argument here uh, goes, goes to plus infinity. Okay? And um, the idea here is that the outcomes are 0 or 1, and as my utility increases towards infinity, then the probability of responding positively becomes closer and closer to 1. Right? So, in other words, the limit as the utility goes to infinity says that I respond positively to the DR request with probability 1. The further my utility goes towards negative infinity, then uh, I, I start to approach uh, the scenario where the probability that I respond positively to the DR response goes to zero, right? And we imagine that there's this S-shaped uh, relationship in, in, in the middle. And uh, actually, if you plug in zero, so e to the zero is, uh, is one, right? e to the zero is one. So of one over one plus one, that's one over two. So if my utility is zero, then that means the probability of responding positively or negatively is just a coin flip. It's 0 0.5. Okay, so that's the neutral uh, setting. All right. So that is logistic uh, regression. Now, here's our objective with this background. Given training examples of the explanatory variables, x, um, so, so x is the vector of explanatory variables, um, which is an n by 1 vector, and we have m training examples, m training examples. And corresponding to each training example, we have a corresponding outcome, 0 or 1, positive or negative, uh, response, for example, um, that's given by y here. So now what we want to do is optimally fit these free parameters that's in this utility function via maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, that is now our optimization objective. All right, so now uh, we're going to go through the derivation, and spoiler alert, you're going to see that this is actually a nice uh, convex optimization problem. Super cool. Um, pretty sophisticated statistical model, um, but to fit the parameters is uh, super simple to do in practice because we just need to solve a convex optimization problem. So here's what we're going to do. First, I'm going to reorder the training data. I'm going to order it such that uh, the first Q examples correspond to outcome Y equals 1. And then uh, examples indexed from Q plus 1 to M correspond to outcome Y equals 0. I do this just for convenience, just for, just for convenience of this uh, derivation here. Okay, so now... Uh, I'm going to walk through the derivation step by step. So we're interested in the likelihood function, which is the probability of the outcomes y, um, as a function of free parameters beta. Now, outcome y is either 1 or 0, with probability p or 1 minus p, respectively. So if I'm interested in the probability of all my examples, that's given going to be given by the probability of, uh, or, or the product of the probabilities of all the independent examples. This is using that independence assumption um, about a random variable. Okay, so that's why I have these products. And the probability of a positive response, y equals 1, will be pi. The probability of a response of 0, like not responding to the DR request, will be 1 minus pi. Okay. So now I'm going to compute the log likelihood function. I'm just going to hit the log um, with this expression here. So the log of a product is the sum of logs. So that's what happens here. I have the sum of 
log pi, and then the sum of log 1 minus pi. So that's all that happened there is using that log property. Now I'm going to substitute in the expression for pi. So pi, we hypothesize, is given by this logistic model, this S-shaped curve where the horizontal axis is capital U, our utility function value, and the vertical axis is um, a positive uh, response. Okay, uh, so here I've just substituted in pi uh, here. And uh, one thing to note here is uh, you, you can see I actually substitute in 1 minus pi here, which is why it's 1 over 1 plus e to the ui. Okay, all right, so now uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to exploit a few properties of the log logarithm. So let me actually just focus on this term, log of uh, this uh, logistic formula. All right, let me focus on log of this logistic formula. All right, so all that's going to happen here is uh, we're going to use properties of the logarithm. That's it. So we have something analogous to the log of products equals uh, the sum of the logs, where if I have the log of a quotient, say log of A over B, this one is equal to log A minus log B. Okay, this is just a fundamental property of the logarithm operator. So when I do that, I get log e to the u minus log of 1 plus e to the u. Now because the uh, natural log specifically in the exponential are inverse functions of each other, I just get back out u and I can do no more simplification on, on the second term. Okay, so here's, here's what I get. Now if we flip back, you'll actually see that this is exactly what the first term uh, turned into here. Now this the second term, let's break that one down uh, for a sec. It's very, very similar. So we have log of 1 all over 1 plus e to the u. So that's, we can use the, the quotient property for logarithms to write this as log 1 minus log 1 plus e to the u. Now the natural log of 1 is just 0. Okay, so in the end we just get minus log of the quantity 1 plus e to the u. Okay, and that's actually exactly what is given in the second term here. All right, so nothing that's in fact too complicated, it's just practicing uh, these log properties. All right, uh, now what we'll notice here is going from 34 to 35, we'll actually bring down the first term, the sum of the ui's from i equals 1 to q. Now this second term and the third term is the same argument. So one is summing from i to q, the other one q plus 1 to m. So we're just going to take the second term and sum it all the way from i equals 1 to m. That's all that happened here, and we have the minus sign that we keep, of course. All right, so now I'm positioned to substitute my formula for the utility function. And buried in the utility function is actually the parameters uh, beta. Okay, so now I can expose this. And I'm just going to rewrite ui as this, uh, this, this inner product here. So, okay, here I'm, I'm, I'm mixing a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, MATLAB uh, code and mathematics. Um, what I'm trying to write here is, is the following. Um, okay, so we have our x vector, and then we have 1. Uh, 
Here, I'm just trying to write in a nice, clean, vectorized form. Uh, the, the formula for our utility function. Okay, So beta beta here is actually a column vector. Uh, actually, now, now I'm realizing I ordered it in an odd way. B naught <laughs> would be at the bottom the way I wrote it. Okay. And then how many betas do we have? We have n betas. Anyways, if uh, my funky notation is a little complicated, you can just mentally substitute this affine expression in, in the betas uh, into here. Okay, now I want you to notice the following, and this is the whole punchline. So this is the key point is this first term is just linear in beta. It's linear in this vector of, of beta parameters. Okay, so, so this part is, is a linear objective function. Now, the second part turns out to be concave with respect to beta. Namely, we have something that looks like log sum exp. And you recall from our chapter on convex optimization that one of the convex function types is the logarithm of a summation of exponentials. So this is exactly that. We have a log, and then we have a summation of, of two things, one and, and an exponential. And then this exponential is, is, uh, is, is linear in, in the beta parameter here. So this is convex. We multiply it with minus one, and we get something that's concave. So maximizing the log likelihood is maximizing a concave function uh, which can be solved by minimizing a convex function. So that's quite incredible. When it comes to identifying the parameters in these discrete choice models, uh, you know, there, there are open source solvers that just do this for you. But the point that I'm trying to tell you is under the hood, it's a convex optimization. So you could do this from scratch yourself if you have some convex optimization solver like CVX or CVXPy. Okay, um, very good. So let me just check uh, how we're doing on time here. And uh, uh, now I'm going to briefly go into time series uh, modeling. Okay. So let's go back and start to think about dynamical systems. So these are systems in, in which uh, there's some state and there's a dynamical process. So you recall from chapter one that uh, we could have a dynamical process governed by, by the ordinary differential equation x dot, where dot is the uh, time derivative, is equal to some function of x, our state, u, our uh, control input. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to explicitly write this semicolon theta to say that this function f could be parameterized by some vector theta. Okay? And this is the dynamics in continuous time. So what I want to do first is, instead of talking about continuous time, talk about discrete time. Why? In practice, our data is sampled in discrete time instances. We don't get a continuous stream of data. So uh, it is useful to think about a discrete time process when we're working with discrete sample data um, to try to identify a mathematical model. Okay, so the discrete time analog of this ODE in 37 is called a difference equation model. So instead of an ordinary differential equation, we have a difference equation model. Okay, and it can be given as follows, where x of k plus 1 equals f of x, k, u, k, and theta. Now k is our discrete time index, and it's related to time t according to the following formula. If we had, for example, a constant sampling time delta t, then k would just be the multiple of delta t, and uh, continuous time t is just basically how many multiples of the sampling time um, are we at right now if we're at time t. All right, so this is a discrete time model, and the objective is the following. We don't know the function f, the, the discrete time uh, difference equation model function f, and it's parameterized by vector theta. So we have time series data x and u, 
And what we'd like to do is fit the parameters theta such that they best fit the, the time series uh, data that we have available. Okay, so our mathematical model will be this function f sub dt. Uh, it has these free parameters theta, and our training examples are going to be the states and, and the inputs uh, x of k and u of k respectively. All right, so let's now go through an example, which is an example that you'll use in your homework and is a popular example in time series modeling. It is called the uh, uh, autoregression with exogenous inputs model, uh, sometimes referred to by this acronym ARX for autoregressive exogenous input. Now, consider the discrete time analog of the nth order ordinary differential equation, where we possibly have n uh, time derivatives. It's going to be given as follows. Uh, the output y at time step k plus 1, well, okay, so, so on the left-hand side of the equation, what we basically have is, uh, is a weighted combination of the outputs y from time step k to, to k minus n. And, and uh, here we have no coefficient on y of k plus 1. And on the right-hand side, we have some uh, weighted combination of the, um, of the outputs. Sorry, of the inputs u. So actually, let me let me rewrite this in a manner that's uh, maybe more intuitive for some. So the idea is, if we want to predict the output one time step ahead, this could be given by a weighted combination of uh, of the current and previous outputs plus a weighted combination of the current and previous inputs. In other words, y of k plus 1 could be given by um, a weighted combination of the current value of y plus the previous values Okay, those are the previous output values, uh, plus the current and previous inputs. All right, now let me flip back just to make sure that I'm consistent with the notation. The A's correspond to Y, the B's correspond to U, and actually if I want it to have the exact same interpretation, I should have minus signs on everything here. Okay, that's, that's fine. I can have minus signs. All right, so that's the idea, is if I want to predict the output one time step ahead, I could uh, predict that using a weighted combination of the output now and the input now, uh, plus a weighted combination of the outputs over the previous n time steps, and the inputs from the previous n time steps. And this is the ARX model. Importantly, uh, AI and BI, these are the scalar parameters. These are the free parameters or the weights or the coefficients that we would like to uh, estimate from our data. So if we lump all the AI and BI parameters into this vector, we, we just aggregate them all together, and all the input-output data, the u's and the y's, into this vector, then it turns out that we can rewrite 39, it's, it's quite easy to see, into uh, the matrix vector form shown here. Okay, And equation 42 is actually an expanded version of what I've shown over here um, in, in Photoshop on this blank template here. Okay, now equation 42 is linear in theta. So it's a linear in the parameters model and therefore we can use uh, least squares regression. Whoops. So here's what we would do. We could aggregate all our data now into vectors and matrices. So, so the y's I'm going to aggregate into this column vector and, and I'm going to imagine for a moment that uh, I have capital K 
uh, training examples, right? And and phi, this phi vector, which if you go back, you'll notice phi encodes uh, a collection of the input and output data, right? So for every phi of k, I'm now going to um, assemble those all into a matrix where the rows of capital phi matrix here is going to be phi transpose of 0, phi transpose of 1, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the, the reason for that is because my ARX model is going to be given by taking uh, the inner product of one of these rows, say, say phi transpose of k, times this parameter vector theta, and that gives me the prediction at uh, y of k plus 1. Right. So now, uh, with this definition, using uh, big Y and big phi, we can then rewrite the entire ARX model for all our data pairs in terms of this overdetermined set of linear equations. It's quite simple. So now, with this format, we can use least squares, and uh, the optimal values for theta are given by this formula here, which are recognized as the least squares formula. So, and we can use least squares, we can use least squares with L2 regression or ridge regression, we can use least squares with L1 or lasso regression, the least absolute uh, shrinkage and selection operator, or any other type of regularization that we are interested in. So this is the ARX model and is something that you will implement in homework 4. So with that, that closes up uh, this lecture on um, um, time series modeling. We're going to take a short break. And the next lecture is going to start up with gradient descent and the neural networks.